Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to Imam Hussein, Humanity's Champion. To briefly recap last episode, we laid the foundations and set in sight our goals and aims for the whole series. The aim and the goal is to have a better understanding of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, to see what kind of sacrifice he gave for Islam and for us. Now to reach that goal, we have to go through a very long path in order to fully understand and to see how other characters in the life of Imam Hussein, for example, his grandfather, his mother, his father, his uh, friends even, his brothers and sisters had an effect on him also, who helped in his upbringing, who supported him and who encouraged or taught him certain things. Finally, in the last episode, we also touched on the nature-nurture debate or argument. Now, when we say argument, we think that there are two separate sides and that these two sides don't mix, that they are against each other. That either somebody's development and growth is solely um, in regards to the nature they've got, in other words, the genetic makeup, their mother, their father, and so on, or we think that their growth and development is dependable upon their nurture, which means their interactions with the environment and surroundings, what they eat, who they speak to, and so on and so forth. Whereas, really, science has taught us today that that's not the case. It's not that it's only one or the other. Science has taught us that it's actually a mixture of these two, and that the one that they thought played the biggest role doesn't. Before, we thought that anything passed down from your parents, the gen genetic makeup, moulds you and that's it. That's all you'll ever be. Whereas science today has taught us that no, 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 no. The genetic makeup is only 20 to 30% of the development of the child. The rest comes from the nurture, which means who that child interacts with and their environment. Now, Imam Hussein is the grandson of the Prophet of Islam. That's not a small figure. We're talking about the seal of the prophets. We're talking about the last prophet ever sent. The prophet whose religion is the complete religion, full stop. So to have a grandfather as such, and then to have a father like Imam Ali, the first Imam, the successor to the prophet, and to have a mother like Hazrat Fatima Zahra salam alayha, who is arguably the sole reason why the universe and everything God has ever created exists is because of her existence. Now this isn't something small to come from a family like this. But what we want to do is before we begin to uh, talk about them and to introduce them, we have to clear up our understanding of them. Now, we have a very important verse in the Qur'an, a verse that many of us don't even know exists because either we don't read so much or we have never put time on it. But this verse is very important in the sense that it sets up who these figures really are. The Ahlul Bayt aren't people, normal people like me to make mistakes, or to have faults, or to think of sin, or to do sin. They're not like me. The Ahlul Bayt were perfect, and we know they were perfect. We know they were infallible, which means they never committed any kind of sin, let alone think of anything bad. We know this because Allah has mentioned this in the Qur'an. In Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 33, Allah has said something and introduced them in such a manner that although it's only a verse, those who ponder and think over its meaning understand who these figures really were. So let's take a listen to what Allah says in that verse. <laughs> Allah 
Now we see from this beautiful verse that Allah has very clearly mentioned that He wishes, He wills to purify the Ahlul Bayt salam, to remove any kind of uncleanliness from them and to give them a thorough purification. As in He doesn't just stop and say I want to remove some dirt from you or some uncleanliness from you. No, no. He goes on to say and give you a thorough purification. So there's no question. There's no shadow of a doubt. There's no part that we can sit and say, well, maybe Allah meant this. Maybe he meant that. He's made it very clear, very short and sharp that, oh, Ahlul Bayt, I have willed to give you a thorough purification. Full stop. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because unfortunately we have people of other faiths um, within the Muslim so-called sector, whether they be Sunni, Wahhabi, so on and so forth, or, or even unfortunately within our own school of thought. We have had certain so-called scholars come and mention that no, the Ahlul Bayt made mistakes. For example, Fatima Zahra, she made a mistake or Imam Al Islam, he did this or he did that. When really this is all false. Where they get their thinking from or their knowledge from, Allah knows where they get such a, a, an idea from. But if they are true Muslims and they have read the Quran, then there's no area to question these personalities. This is a very big fundamental of faith, of Islam. If we backtrack and look, for example, at anything in the world, for example, take a skyscraper, a very tall building. Before a civil engineer wants to build that tall building and make it, for example, tower over anything else, he first has to build the foundation. He first has to dig it up and make sure that the foundation is solid before he builds anything on top of it. Otherwise, it will crumble under that weight. It won't be able to bear that weight of the, of the building, of the skyscraper. And similar to a farmer who wants to, for example, plant seeds to grow some kind of a fruit tree or wheat or so on, he first plows the field, makes sure it's fertile, you know, aerates the soil to give it something extra, to, give, to, to bring it back to life before he plants the seeds. Because he knows that the foundations need to be strong so that the plant or the tree can grow into a strong fashion. Same with us. In order for us to have a strong religion, a strong belief, and to mould ourselves, to grow ourselves in a way that we are supporting Islam and becoming representatives of Islam and you know, spreading the message of Islam, we have to first make sure that our roots are deep, that our foundations are strong, to be able to hold the weight of this message. The same way the skyscraper has a weight, this message of Islam has a weight. It needs to be able to rest upon someone and something that is solid, that can't be moved or shaken. That if a wind comes and blows, it won't fall over and topple. Now, when I say a wind coming and going, that's an analogy for you know, the Satan, for enemies of Islam, for people who want to take away our faith and strip us of the message of Islam. So we have to be strong. We have to understand that these personalities aren't just any old people. They're not me. Uh, we're not talking about me giving a message. This is the Prophet of Islam, Imam Ali alayhi salam, Hasta Fatima Zahra salam alayha and Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Back to the verse, we see that Allah mentions He's given them a thorough purification. This isn't, for example, me saying that I want to clean this table. So bring me a spray, bring me a cloth and let me clean this table as thoroughly as I can. Now even if I try and put a hundred percent into cleaning the table, you may come and look at it and say, well, you've just wiped it, but some dust has settled on it. Or there's still a mark there. So therefore, that table is not thoroughly clean. 
it's not purified absolutely. There's still some marks, there's still some defaults with the table. But here we're talking about Allah speaking. It's not me saying I want to clean something. This is Allah saying I have willed to do something. And we know that when Allah wills to do something, it happens, full stop. To look at it from a logical point of view, Allah has said that I have sent to you the prophets and the imams as guides. That we humans need to follow these pure guides if we want to succeed in life. If we want to reach the ultimate goal, which is heaven and submitting to Allah in the best fashion, we have to have the best teachers. Now, Allah being all just, we have to believe he's all just. That's one of the uh, fundamentals of Islam, one of the usul al-deen. The first one is to believe that there is one Allah, Tawheed. The second is to believe that that one God is all just. That he doesn't, for example, take sides, that he, everything he does is for our benefit. Now, if we stop and we think, okay, so a just creator, Allah, has sent us guides, but these guides, sometimes they're at fault, sometimes they make a mistake, they're not infallible. If we think this, if this is the case, then we have a big problem in our hands. Then the whole system is flawed. Allah says, I'm sending you guides to, set, to teach you the way to heaven so that you won't be punished, for example. But then these teachers themselves are not perfect, so they might take a route that isn't the correct route and them being our teachers and us being told to follow these teachers we follow them and we also go down the wrong route then how can Allah punish us? how can Allah say for example now I'm going to punish you for such and such action because you shouldn't have done that we say well Allah your, your teacher that you sent the teacher that you sent us we've just followed them how can you punish us according to, according to your own laws and rules? So we see that it doesn't even make sense. It's like having a sat-nav, and I bring this up as an example because the other day I was driving somewhere with my father and I typed in the sat-nav, the destination we wanted to go to, yet once we got there and it says you have now reached your destination, we saw that it's not the place that we wanted to go to. So we called up the people, our friends, and we said, look, uh, you know, we, we've arrived at the destination, but it's not here, so can you please guide us? And we saw that actually the place that the satnav had taken us was a mile and a half difference from the actual destination of where we wanted to go to. Now, if we stop and we say, well, this satnav is perfect, you know, it never makes a mistake, and we follow it, then fine. But in this case, the satnav made a mistake. Who do I blame? Do I blame me, the driver, or do I blame the satnav, the guide? Well, I blame the satnav. I say, this took me there, this told me to turn left, to turn right, and we ended up here. So it doesn't make sense for Allah to send a guide or a satna for us humans, yet they are flawed, or they have mistakes, or they think wrong. The Ahlul Bayt al were thoroughly pure. So it shows that Imam Hussein to grow up in a family where his grandfather is an infallible, his parents are infallibles, his sisters and brothers around him are infallibles. This shows that the kind of upbringing he had was always seeing the best example. When you want to, for example, um, you want to learn a new craft or a new trade like carpentry, you go to the best kind of teacher and they teach you something, you pick up their skills. You pick up how they handle certain tools. You pick up, for example, what materials they use and you learn from the best. Well, here Imam Hussein has also learned from the best. He's been surrounded by the best teachers, the best examples of character and human beings and morals and ethics. Now, some of you might say, if Imam Hussein is an infallible and part of the Ahlul Bayt, which he is, then he's perfect already. There's no need to discuss his father, his mother, and so on and so forth, his brothers, his sisters, because he's perfect. He knew what he had to do from birth, from before birth, and he carried it out perfectly. He didn't need a guide, he didn't need a teacher, he didn't need... That's correct, he didn't need any of these. But the reason why we're discussing these is because we are trying to understand him and the people around him. It's not... Uh, our, our aim is to 
perfect ourselves. Our aim is to better ourselves as mothers, as fathers, as brothers, as sisters, as sons, as daughters, as aunties, uncles. So our aim here is to look at them and take lessons from them and to better ourselves. So that, for example, now when we mention Hazrat Fatima Zahra, Salamu Allah Alayha, any kind of mother or uh, girl thinking to become a mother or auntie or so on, looks at their own behaviour and says, okay, that's how we should be. So let me take lessons from her and become more like her. Or any father looks at Imam Ali salam, and says, those were the lessons that, for example, he taught to Imam, uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam. This is how he helped bring up Imam Hussain alayhi salam. So let me be more like Imam Ali alayhi salam. And any son looking at Imam uh, Hussain alayhi salam or any of the Imams or, or even the women of the Ahlul Bayt, men can learn from the women as well. It's not, we're not sexist here to say that women only take the women as examples and men only take the men. No, no, no. We learn from Hasta Fatima Zahra salam alayhi. We learn from Bibi Zainab We learn from the women just as we learn from the men. But the reason why we want to look so in depth and look at everything around is so that we try and take as many lessons as we can. We try to pick up as much as we can so that we don't fail as humans in our point of submission to Allah. That we do our best in passing this message on to our children, to people around us and so on. So join me, inshallah, for the next episode where we will begin to introduce these characters and look into how they have helped bring up the Imams and what we can take away from their morals and their ethics and the different events that occurred in their lives. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.